Good Lord, the first round of the NFL draft is in the novels. It has came and went after 9,000 months of preparation. I want to get right into it because I want to get this video out as soon as possible before round two and three start, which we'll be doing a recap video for as well. We want to talk about all the offensive players, all the uh, skill player reactions, what that does for us, what what's happening inside our bodies right now in our guts and in our soul as it relates to fantasy football, more specifically, you know, your dynasty rookie drafts, which are going to start happening at a hot and heavy pace. Crazy first round, crazy first round. Actually, eh, kind of simmered down, but a few picks that were just out of control, okay? So make sure you're subscribed. We're going to be doing recaps. Actually, tomorrow I'm going to do it with Noah. Noah's going to jump on. Me and him are going to recap all of round two and three, which I'm sure there will be a good amount of running backs and stuff, so we'll have some, some hot takes for that. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel. We're also doing a full uh, fantasy draft later today on the channel we're live streaming at 4 p.m eastern time all right we're going to do a full underdog draft so make sure you got notifications on for the channel and if you're new to the underdog fantasy platform go download it the link will be down below and use promo code bdge if it's your first time depositing on the platform they will give you a 100 percent deposit match 4 p.m eastern time make sure you check back in here let's get to it we've got bryce young number one Overall pick to the Carolina Panthers. This was no surprise. Uh, listen, the weapons there are obviously terrible. They got a, a little bit of a rebuild ahead of them, but they were a top 10 pass blocking offensive line per PFF last year. So I think he's probably in a little bit of a better situation than we're going to give him credit for. Uh, he is my QB1 in Dynasty rookie drafts. He's not my 101, but he is my QB1, despite you know some other interesting landing spots. I'm not particularly excited about him for fantasy this year whatsoever. He's not someone I'm like really even targeting as my QB2 in Superflex. Uh, I do think it gives some stability to those pass catchers on the team now. They signed DJ Chark. They got Adam Thielen, Hayden Hurst. They signed more particularly like Miles Sanders. I feel like it's nice that they have him there. They can kind of lean on him as like a workhorse and take a little bit of pressure off of Bryce Young as they rebuild the team. But he's been their guy clearly for a while. Uh, first overall pick in the draft. He will be my 102. All of my rankings will be updated in real time in our rookie draft guide on BDGE.co. So Bryce Young, they get their guy after trading away draft capital to get a lot of guys. We move on to number two. C.J. Stroud goes to the Houston Texans. Nice, nice smokescreen job here. You know, I, I guess the way you look at it and it, the NFL draft process just comes with so much overthinking. But you look at a team that has the number two overall pick, a glaring hole at the QB position in a draft that has clearly they just told us the NFL just told us three top five prospects. So you go into the draft with the number two pick. You have a glaring need at quarterback. You have three guys that get picked inside the top five QBs or expected to. You're not going to leave the draft without a quarterback. And everybody wants to talk about tanking. It's just not that easy to do. Like one, you know, a few play we've seen many times over the years where like a team like Houston was uh, one of the teams where they had like a, a long touchdown at the end of a game that changed the draft order for them. Look at the Jets. The Jets should have Trevor Lawrence had they not won a game at the end of the year and took Zach Wilson instead. These things just happen you can't force tanking it sets your team back by like years and you're trying to build an infrastructure and you're trying to build a winning culture around the players that are in your locker room at the time okay so players are playing their heart out because they need to play for contracts too so the whole like tanking discussion is it's pretty fucking insufferable to be honest with you no one wants to fucking do that so doing that and being like we're just gonna get Caleb Williams next year it's like it needs to be a near flawless tank job in order for you to be the number one overall pick. And now we have the Cardinals, right? Obviously, they took C.J. Stroud, traded back up for Will Anderson, so had the two and three pick. Now the Cardinals are actually Vegas' favorite projections to have the number one and the number two pick in next year's draft. Is that going to play out to fruition? Definitely not, because that shit never happens. But they have a really, really high chance of being the team that drafts Caleb Williams next year. But let's talk about C.J. Stroud. Really like the pick, like the spot, like the landing spot, like the prospect C.J. Stroud. Very accurate. I think their offense is kind of like, eh, obviously right now, right? They got Nico Collins. You got John Mechie coming back. Robert Woods, they signed. Dalton Schultz, they signed. Damian Pierce. Now, what I will say is like hard to be excited about them right now, of course. They have a little rebuild ahead of them. But kind of feels like the Chicago situation, you know, where you have a lot of mediocre pieces on offense. You have the quarterback of the future. You have a lot of mediocre pieces on offense. If you go out and add that real number one guy, right, you, you add – the game changer, the needle mover on the offense, 
and everybody's responsibility kind of moves one slot down on the totem pole. And now you have, you're looking at something pretty strong, right? Like Chicago adding DJ Moore to the mix now makes Justin Fields, but more importantly, you know, Darnell Mooney, Chase Claypool, Cole Komet, way more sexy on offense from an NFL standpoint. And I think like the Texans are kind of gross on paper, but you add in that one, you make one or two like really strong moves and your offense changes, man. That's how the NFL works, right? We saw it with Chicago. We saw it with basically Baltimore within the last like two weeks. Their offense is going to be way better now it, within the span of, uh, of something like that, the snap of a finger. So Stroud, obviously love the pick. He's going to be a top four super flex pick for me. He will not be the number three because two picks later, the Indianapolis Colts select Mr. Anthony Richardson. Now, this is, I mean, it's just a, a fucking super exciting pick, right? They talked all offseason about how they wanted to bring in a quarterback, how they wanted to draft a quarterback, start from scratch, because Shane Steichen comes in from the Eagles. He is their head coach. He worked and developed with Jalen Hurts. All right, let's not act like that was all him. Like, Jalen Hurts was a guy who improved, like, year over year over year over year, dating back to college. He developed himself, all right? He got a lot better each year, and I think he probably would have done so with or without staying uh, Shane Steichen, but similar style of QBs, right? Like mobile, obviously, that can use every part of their physical gifts in order to beat defenses. And Shane, uh, I cannot say that fucking name to save my life. Shane Steichen, also on like a six-year contract, so they got a little bit of room here. They got some time to develop Anthony Richardson, which is what they're going to need to do, obviously. Uh, those six-year contracts very rarely work out. If, it, if a coach is really, really bad, they just fucking cut him loose and then pay him while he's sitting out in Margaritaville for the next six years. Here's a thread from uh, Pat Corain that I'll just kind of read to you guys. If you're listening via podcast, you don't see the images on the screen, I would suggest going over to YouTube. Give us a subscribe. But if you're on the podcast, rating and review would be beautiful as well. Shane Steichen on Anthony Richardson. I think the development of players comes with more experience. I think when you play more, that's how you develop. Practice reps, game reps, I think that's how you develop. Wheels all the way up on Minshew providing a buffer period for AR. Gardner's a good player. Obviously, we brought him in here for a reason. I mean, we get to get Anthony in here and get him started in OTAs and go through training camp and go through that process and see where it goes from there. On Richardson, rushing ability definitely helps. I mean, when a guy can run and add that element to your offense, it's a big plus. It puts stress on defenses, and obviously he has that capability. But I just wouldn't sleep on his throwing ability either. I mean, that ball comes out pretty now. He could spin it. He's got a huge arm, and he makes some huge plays in the pass game. So we're excited to work with him on QB development. Those guys got to get reps, learn the system, learn the offense. You guys have heard me say this a bunch. We got to build this thing around the quarterback. Honestly, after reading that, it kind of feels like you went to the comment section of a TikTok video where someone just commented like, bro, just talking just to talk. He just said a whole lot of nothing. You know, I don't, I, here, here's what I'll say. Like I listened to a lot of podcasts last night and this morning, more so people that are actually in tune with the NFL. I was listening to the Athletics podcast uh, where they brought on a Colts beat reporter who has spoken to Chris Ballard. And you know, Chris Ballard is a dude who loves traits. He loves big time traits in the players that he drafts. Anthony Richardson comes with some of the most high end, the most elite traits, regardless of whether or not it's all put together. But apparently, this beat reporter said, uh, Chris Ballard pretty much made up his mind about Anthony Richardson a month ago. And he was that that was like their pick at number four. And he said like the toughest part was just waiting to see what happens at number three if a team jumps up to grab uh Anthony Richardson there. I don't know what they would have done otherwise, but A Rich goes at four um, he's going to be my QB2 in the class. He's going to be the 103 for me. So we have Bijan, Bryce Young, and then Anthony Richardson. And I'm not going to argue with anyone if you want to take – I think Richardson's in that tier. I think he's – if you want to go with him at the 101, not personally what I'm going to do, way more into Bijan Robinson and his landing spot, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, I also feel safer about Bryce Young in terms of what I think he'll develop into as a quarterback and just his longevity. And I just feel more confident in Bryce Young as the player. And then Anthony Richardson's upside's crazy. But if you want to take him anywhere in the top three, I got no argument with it. I actually kind of love it for Michael Pittman and Jonathan Taylor. I think like the linebackers cannot just zone in on Jonathan Taylor. I also like the idea of having someone completely opposite of like what Matt Ryan was last year and someone not afraid to sling it downfield to a dude like Michael Pittman. He's a big body wide receiver, right? And you need to let him make those plays. You can't, you can't just use him six yards away from the line of scrimmage. That's not his strong point. And that's like the only thing we got from him last year with Matt Ryan and with these other quarterbacks uh, throwing him the ball. So we need someone that can complement Michael Pittman's skill set. So whether or not those balls get delivered to him accurately, one thing. But we need, in order to unlock Michael Pittman's upside, 
you at least at the bare minimum need a QB that can sling the ball downfield, and Anthony Richardson can absolutely do that. As uh, will he get onto the field ASAP? I don't know. I think I'll have a camp battle between Richardson and Gardner Minshew. Is he capable of winning that job outright? Absolutely. Do they want to just like sit him for the first month, two months, even first year? I think like what you don't want to see, worst case scenario is like we see another Trey Lance, Jimmy G situation where, you know, they won't admit it, but they have the entire summer to work with this guy. And then they just say like, mm, we don't see enough to make him start. We don't see enough that he could be. And this would even be worse because Gardner Minshew is not what Jimmy G is. Obviously, he's not a winner like him. So if A. Richardson can't beat out Gardner Minshew, it's a little bit worrisome, but Richardson's fucking young as hell. He's 20 years old, so he's got plenty of time to develop. Absolutely love the landing spot. Love the draft capital. Nothing not to love here. Uh, if, if you don't like the player, which I've been vocal enough about saying that, like I'm worried about his accuracy and things like that, but he has so much time to develop into the player that we want him to be. The ceiling is real here, as is for Mr. B. John Robinson at pick number eight goes to the Atlanta Falcons. Listen, I slept on it. I slept on it. I'm all in. I'm all in. This is the top pick in the draft. There was not a better pick in round one than Bijan Robinson to Atlanta. It's not even close. Fact, not opinion. The number one value pick, the number one player pick, the number – this might have been the best pick the last 10 years, if we're just being honest, you know. I try to come on here and just spit complete honesty. Try not to lie to you guys. Try not to exaggerate. Try not to say things just to make myself feel better. Bijan Robinson, number eight to Atlanta. Okay. Super Bowl runs through us. Super Bowl LVIII runs through Atlanta. Fight me. Fight me. You're going to lose. Arthur Smith finds his Derrick Henry. He gets his Derrick Henry. Now, I don't think enough people realize this, but the Atlanta Falcons graded out as the single best run blocking offensive line in the NFL last year. We re signed our two big guys this offseason. We have a very good structure for our offensive line, and Bijan gets to run behind the single best run blocking unit in the NFL next year. It takes a ton of pressure off Desmond Ritter to have to do anything, okay? Tyler Algier, yeah, he's just a breather back now. He's just a complimentary back. I would be surprised if Correll Patterson gets more than two carries a game here. So now we've got Pitts, we've got London, we've got Bijan, all top 10 invested draft capital pieces in three straight years. Good Lord, Desmond Ritter, just, just, just don't be terrible. Just don't be, just don't be the worst quarterback of all time and, and you'll be fine. B. John Robinson, he's my 101 in Dynasty Rookie Drafts. I think this landing spot with Arthur Smith, they are going to... I mean, the beautiful part about this is a guy like Bijan, you know, getting first-round capital, which we knew he was going to get. But now you get him on the five-year contract because you get that team option going into year five. So he's he's just going to be this offense for a long, long time. And we just saw the amount of work that Arthur Smith gave to Derrick Henry and just, like, the setup of that offense. And... I don't know if there was a better landing spot. Like maybe Philadelphia, because the team's already set up in probably a better position in terms of like scoring and stuff like that. But Bijan walks right into like he could have he could have went to Detroit, which we'll talk about in a second. He could have went to one of these spots where there's already established running backs there. I just don't see a world where he doesn't walk into. I don't know if I can make a good argument for him not to be like a top five six redraft pick this year. Right, like C-Mac probably won, and then you start to look at the wide receivers, uh, Justin Jefferson's, Jamar Chase's, and then it's like, I get it. Like Maybe you're looking at Eckler. Maybe you want Stephon Diggs. You can make the argument for Travis Kelsey, but Bijan Robinson deserves to be in the argument for like the 104, the 105 in redraft league. So you're going to tell me top five player in fantasy shouldn't be the 101 immediately on your dynasty team? Yes. Similar to what I said like in a video last week, similar to what I was just talking about with Chicago's wide receiver group and Houston's wide receiver group, your fantasy team is usually like one or two big pieces away from turning that shit around. You're, if you have Bijan Robinson on your fantasy team, you're not four years away from rebuilding. You're probably one or two years away from being a top contender because you don't come across many dudes who average 20, 23, half PPR fantasy points per game. And when you do, it's very hard to be a bad fantasy team. So Bijan Robinson locks that up for you. He's a dude who's going to step into 20 touches immediately. He's a dude whose offense needs to rely on him. They need, this is going to take so much pressure off Desmond Ritter. You love to fucking see it. So Bijan to eight, best pick possibly of all time in the history of the NFL draft. Jameer Gibbs, possibly the worst pick in the history of the NFL draft. It's just the new Theo Riddick. Theo Riddick incarnated. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Don't fucking clip that. I, I think it's crazy that not that. Listen, if they love Jameer Gibbs, cool, whatever. You trade up, you get your guy, you get your offensive weapon. I think it was kind of crazy that 
they didn't take Christian Gonzalez here. I think they had other needs that they probably needed to go for. Probably could have got Jameer Gibbs down at 18. There was a lot of hype, a lot of teams that loved them, so maybe someone like trades up and takes him. I don't I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like the Detroit Lions could have probably executed their draft a little bit better. I mean, I look at like the Lions and the Seahawks, who very similar structures heading into the draft, like two teams very clearly on the rise with these veteran uh, quarterbacks that could have went with the backup QB to be, you know, the, the the face of the franchise in the future. Both of them have two first round picks, which were very close to each other. Both of them have two second round picks. Both of them have their third round pick. So extremely, like, honestly, kind of creepily similar situations. And I feel like they went in complete opposite directions. Loved Seattle's first round hated Detroit's first round but let's talk about it from a fantasy perspective like you have you have the Detroit Lions is like boardroom the, the videos that leaked like the way they're celebrating you would have thought they they grabbed Bijan Robinson in the second round or something like that they just signed David Montgomery to this three-year 18 million dollar deal uh which in all effect is pretty much like a, a two-year deal they can they can get out after two years DeAndre Swift what does this mean for DeAndre Swift? I, I don't see a world where he's not traded by tomorrow I don't think they're going to get a day two pick, so I don't know if the pick hap- I don't know if the trade happens today, or if, if if it's like some sort of combination where a team's moving up and including Swift in the pick. I don't see a world where he's not moved. You know what's going to happen? The Chiefs are going to give like a fifth round pick for DeAndre Swift, and then DeAndre Swift's just going to be an absolutely uh, a fucking revelation out there. In case, like, imagine DeAndre Swift. Do you remember DeAndre Swift and Clyde edwards helaire were picked in the same draft that year? And Clyde was obviously the only first-round running back, but Swift was, I don't know, 20 picks later or something like that. Imagine DeAndre Swift had been picked by KC. I feel like we'd still be valuing him as like a third-round startup pick, even if he had never put it together. Because on a, on a per-carry, on a per-touch, on a per-snap basis, Swift is a literally a top-10 running back in the league in basically every metric. He just can't stay on the field. I, I, I don't see a world where Swift is not moved within the next couple days. I don't see a world where he's not traded today or tomorrow during the draft. This is the last year on his contract for the Lions anyways, but Gibbs feels like a more explosive DeAndre Swift, I suppose. He's smaller, obviously. He's sub-200. I think Swift is probably a better runner than Jameer Gibbs. They're clearly building something with their offense, right? You draft Jameson Williams really high last year. You bring on Jameer Gibbs, and now you have a couple of guys that can absolutely just fucking lace a defense, right? Like sub-4-4 four, four guys, mid-4-3 four, guys, that speed is fucking real. And you look at DeAndre Swift last year. He had 70 targets in 14 games. Hawkinson is not there anymore. Uh, and you look at, like, in games where Hawkinson was no longer on the team, Swift's target numbers jumped up from 4.2 per game up to 5.4 per game, okay? They badly need playmakers in this offense. As much as it doesn't seem like that, especially in that first month and a half now that Jameson Williams is suspended. So he'll be a weapon in this offense, right? He's not obviously going to get 20 carries a game, but he can for sure get 80 targets year one and, you know, 100 carries, or something like that, and be a playmaker and have a lot of upside in that first um, month, month and a half when Jameson Williams out. They, they need playmakers in that offense. Touchdown upside obviously scares me a little bit, right, because David Montgomery is going to play that Jamal Williams role. And Jamal Williams, 33 goal line carries last year. The next closest running back in the NFL, Zeke at 19. So massive gap there. David Montgomery going to be the touchdown guy. But if they get close to the ends, I, I don't want to say, I don't think Jameer Gibbs has a lot of touchdown upside. I just straight up, I just don't think he has it um, because we've seen very clearly like Dan Campbell, this offense, what they want to do when they get to the goal line. They want to give it to their bigger back. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, Jameer Gibbs is like shifty. And I think that's what the, I, I proje- to project something that we just clearly have seen the opposite of would be borderline psychotic. So I, I, I don't know if I see him scoring more than like five, six touchdowns as a rookie. But where his upside comes into play is obviously on third downs and in the pass-catching situations. He's a phenomenal wide receiver, so I wouldn't be surprised if they used him a lot in the slot. They're gonna, they're just going to have to move around. Like, their offensive pieces are basically just going to be a, a shifting, like, enigma of, of moving all over the field. It feels a lot like C.J. Spiller, ninth overall pick. I actually tweeted this out earlier today. Just top 12 draft capital is 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 insane. For Jameer Gibbs. It, it, same for any running back, honestly, that's not Bijan Robinson level esque of talent. Tweeted this out earlier today. Make sure you follow me on Twitter. Running backs drafted in the first 12 picks since 2010. 2018, you had Saquon at pick two. 2017, you had Fournette and C Mac at picks four and eight. 
2016, you had Zeke at pick four. 2015, you had Gurley at pick 10. 2012, you had T. Raw Rich at pick three. 2010, you had both C.J. Spiller and Ryan Matthews at pick nine and 12. So you look back at 2012, 2010, Matthews, C.J. Spiller, T. Rich. Not great picks in the top 12. Um, but if you look back most recently, like the NFL has not really missed on these earlier round running backs or the early first round running backs. Saquon, Fournette, C-Mac, Zeke, Gurley. Like they've been pretty spot on with that, okay? Uh, C.J. Spiller was the only sub-200 pound running back on that list. Jameer Gibbs falls into that spectrum. So that's still obviously a concern, but I just don't like top 12 draft capital for running back in today's world is just crazy. I just don't, I'm just not going to overthink it. I'm not going to overthink it. I'm kind of going into it with the expectation that Swift gets moved. If he doesn't, that's another conversation we have to have. But for now, we must continue this conversation um, into Jackson Smith and Jigba down at 20. So we had like eight picks in a row that were all defensive players. But JSN lands in Seattle. Pick 20, the wide receiver one off the board. And now I think it becomes a discussion like after, uh, you know, some people are going to have Gibbs all the way up at like 103, I think, honestly. I think they might have it like... If you like Gibbs a lot, you're probably the same type of person that really likes Anthony Richardson, and I got no problem with that. You're talking about just like upside players, so you might have get you might have a world where it's like Richardson, Bijan, Gibbs, or Bijan, Richardson, Gibbs. If you're more of a, like a traditional risk averse type player, uh, myself probably falls into that. I like Bijan, I like Bryce, I like Richardson, I like Stroud, and then you get into the conversation of which skill player do you like next? Do you feel safer with JSN at 105? Do you feel like Gibbs at Top 12 draft capital is just too sexy to pass up on. I think I'm probably leaning towards the latter, even being more risk-averse with the quarterbacks. Uh, I think 105 right now is probably Gibbs for me, and then we get to Jackson Smith and Jigba again. I, I love the Seahawks round one. Uh, Devon Witherspoon at cornerback, like, shores up that position for him after hitting on the draft. Like, they nailed the draft last year. They were fucking flawless, and then they're doing it again this year. They're doing it again this year. They have two more second-round picks and their third-round pick. Just fucking Seattle putting on a goddamn clinic over here. Uh, I love the real-life landing spot for JSN. It, it's like a per, it's like a puzzle, bro. It's like a perfectly aligned puzzle where Lockett and Metcalf play on the outside, and JSN is in the slot. They've been looking for their wide receiver three for a long time. Now, contract-wise, we obviously got to talk about it. DK Metcalf there at a minimum through 2024. Lockett gets a little more interesting. You look at this year, he's obviously going to be in Seattle, but they absolutely have an out after this year where they could save $9 million by getting rid of Tyler Lockett. After that, they'll save $16 million. So I don't see him being in Seattle for longer than 2024. Obviously, he's on the older side. He's past year 30 already. It's not sexy for this year, of course, just because he's likely walking into the wide receiver three role in an offense that's heavily going to utilize Kenneth Walker, of course. But I think there's a good chance sooner rather than later uh, a 21-year-old Jackson Smith and Jigba is simply just better than a 30-year-old Tyler Lockett. I think that could happen by like week eight. That could happen this year, absolutely. Love Tyler Lockett. Love everything he's done. You know, fucking if I'm a Seattle fan, I salute your ass and I say move aside from Mr. JSN, Jackson and Jigba, if you were going by the uh, the little girl that was super nervous announcing the name last night. You know, and I said, I was like, that's the Smith part of Smith and Jigba, not not optional. You, you can't just leave that out, but she did so. And now Jackson and Jigba finds himself as the three in Seattle. Again, and this is one of those I'm just not going to overthink it. Weird landing spot when you start to think about it, but this shit happens every year. And he's the wide receiver one in an offense and on a team that's clearly ascending. I just like, just don't, just don't, don't overthink it. If you want to start overthinking it, start overthinking it as the next uh, wide receivers rip off the board. I'm going to try to go through these. Actually, I'm not going to try to go through these quickly. Fuck it. We're here for a reason. Four wide receivers go off the board in a row. Okay. We have JSN going to Seattle at 20. Next pick, Quentin Johnson goes to the Chargers at 21. Zay Flowers goes to Baltimore at 22. Jordan Addison goes to the Vikings at 23. Quentin Johnson, they this was just such a role specific pick, like really interesting spot because Johnson, they they barely they 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 very very clearly needed more explosion on the outside and they needed someone who could do something with the ball in his hands. He is a speed guy and he is a yak guy. He does both of them, right? Averaged 17.8 yards per reception last year. Averaged 8.9 yards after the catch. After the catch, this dude added 8.9 yards on average, to his receptions last year, which was second in the NCAA among wide receivers with at least 50 catches. Now, 
Williams, Mike Williams and Keenan Allen just aren't those dudes, right? They're not the downfield stretchers. Mike Williams is a downfield playmaker, but he's not a dude who, like, beats the secondary down there. He wins in other ways. So Johnson brings an element to this offense now that is kind of sexy, that we just haven't really seen with Justin Herbert. So he's like a perfect complement to them. And, and now this offense is terrifying with Herbert under center, right? You have Mike Williams on the outside. You have Quentin Johnson on the outside. You have Keenan Allen in the middle. You have hopefully Austin Eckler playing in L.A. for another year. Most importantly, Kellen Moore coming in as the O.C. This offense is going to rip. Now, I think Quentin Johnson probably needs a little bit more polish as a prospect than as a wide receiver, but like, what better situation to be thrown into than this one where he can learn from Keenan Allen and Mike Williams and Kellen Moore and have Justin Herbert. Like, this is, it's just, it's going to be fun to watch. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful landing spot for Quentin Johnson. And I'm looking at him as a player. Matt Harmon graded him out in rece- uh, reception perception, 85th percentile versus man coverage. That's really fucking good, okay? Terrible versus zone, but that doesn't matter. We don't need him to win versus zone. 59th percentile versus press. So that's, you know, above average, but also doesn't matter because he's he's not going to see, like, a ton of double coverage and stuff. He's very, very fast, and he's very quick. Like, I don't, I just don't see him getting a lot of press with the size, et cetera. But, you know, I, again, I, I think it's worth noting the contracts here, of course, because Keenan Allen's getting older. Uh, Mike Williams' future with the Chargers, we'll have to see. Like, there were a lot of rumors this spring about Keenan Allen being a potential cut candidate, which always seemed fucking really stupid. But they were still there, so it's worth noting. Mike Williams got the big contract extension last year. They'll save $20 million against the cap if they get rid of him after 2023. Keenan Allen, they'll save $23 million against the cap after next year. And Justin Herbert, that contract, it's 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 going to eat their books up. It's like a fucking dog eating homework, man. Their, their books are going to be chewed alive by the Herbert contract, okay? But I also I, I don't think, like, of course you're always looking to the future and you're trying to replace talent that's going to be on the way out. This just feels like a move that was, you know, we got a window. Let's put the best pass catcher. Let's put the best weapons around our best quarterback as we possibly can. Let's get him as many weapons as we possibly can. I am more uncertain about Johnson as a player than I am JSN, so I'm going to put him below him, but not very far. I feel like he's the biggest winner in terms of landing spot. Uh, So I, I actually really, really like this for Quentin Johnson. On the other side of things, A. Flowers goes off the board next to the Baltimore Ravens, pick 22. Exciting couple weeks for... Baltimore, well, exciting, yeah, a couple weeks, I guess. Uh, they resigned Lamar, obviously, to the five-year deal. They bring in OBJ. Hopefully, Rashad Bateman's back and healthy. Mark Andrews. This is, I'd be really fucking excited if I was a Ravens fan, man. It's kind of funny because you look at, like, you look at what the Ravens tried to do when they first brought in Lamar Jackson, and it was literally like, let's put as much speed on the field. as We don't care if they're good at football. Let's put as much speed around Lamar Jackson as possible and see how teams can defend us. Miles Boykin. Devin Duvernay. Justice Hill. Just a horrible game plan. Just didn't work in any sense of the imagination. So they're like, let's go with a different direction. Let's go with a bunch of pass catchers that can actually separate and run routes. And now they have that, right? Now you have Rashad Bateman and OBJ and Zay Flowers. And OBJ is obviously not what he used to be, but they're not going to need him to be that, right? Because they have these other players that can take pressure off him with Mark Andrews and stuff. You have uh, Todd Munkin coming in. And I, I think it's fun. I, I, I think that part is probably going to be overplayed a little bit. Obviously had those years in Tampa Bay where they were kind of just like chucking the ball downfield. Didn't really fucking matter what was going on there. Georgia, like they got almost no production from their wide receivers at Georgia over the last couple of years as he was the offensive coordinator. It was all Brock Bowers, tight end. It was all just running the ball. It was all pass catching running backs. I get it. Georgia was awesome, but I don't think most of that was just like Todd Munkin lighting up his wide receiver statistics. I get it. Let, let's be real here. That like this was one of my fears was why a wide receiver, one of the top prospects, going to Baltimore it happened to be Zay Flowers. Unfortunately, I think he's a. I think he's gonna be an awesome real life addition to the Ravens and Lamar Jackson. I think he's just gonna be like, I don't know. I it, it just feels like fantasy wide receivers for Baltimore are almost like the Patriots running backs, where it's like, yeah, we. We love a lot of dudes, and we project a lot of fantasy upside, but very rarely does it come to fruition. Not, I just don't love the landing spot, okay? I like the landing spot for Jordan Addison, who went one pick later to the Vikings a lot better. The Addison-Justin Jefferson combo is is, is sexy. They, they needed another wide receiver bad. You have Adam Thielen leaving his nursing home, going over to Carolina. I think this could very much be like a A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith situation, right? A lot of comps of Jordan Addison to Devonta Smith. I think Devonta Smith is a better wide receiver, but just to you know, put in your head 
what we're kind of envisioning here. Adam Thielen and KJ Osborne combined for 197 targets last year. So there's opportunity in this offense. He'll get on the field ASAP, be a very, very large contributor, be a guy who gets a lot of snaps right away. I think he could produce as arguably maybe the number one rookie wide receiver this year, statistically. Long term, I don't think he's going to be the wide receiver one in this class, but there aren't a lot of real wide receiver ones like in this class that a team is going to look at as their alpha. And Jordan Addison will never get there, obviously, with Justin Jefferson. But I do like the spot. I do I do think he can develop into a 900,000-yard receiver as a complimentary piece to Jefferson, take some pressure off Jefferson because he's always fucking bracketed and doubled and all that kind of shit. And um, Addison could be a, a big playmaker in this offense. So I like the pick. Not overly in love with it, um, but – you know, good. Not 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 a not a loser here. Dalton Kincaid, one of my biggest winners. Twenty fifth overall, the Bills trade up to jump the Dallas Cowboys to grab Dalton Kincaid, Utah tight end. I fucking love this pick. I love it for Buffalo. They badly needed another weapon, and and I man, I was I listened to enough podcasts today that some of the takes just really got me going. Like someone was like, first of all, like people are kind of confused. Like why Dalton Kincaid? Like Dawson Knox is there. Dawson Knox is is just like another guy on the football field that happened to have a really good NFL combine. Like he's, how are we four years into this guy's career and we can't like objectively see what he is on a football field? He's just not that good of like a pass catching player. He's just a player. They give him an extension. He's like Josh Allen's best friend, whatever, make him happy, make sense. Him and Dalton Kincaid, there, there was someone I was listening to today that was like, they're kind of like similar players. They bring a lot to the field that are the same. I'm like, bro, you can only have an asinine take like that if you've actually never watched any Dalton Kincaid film and if you haven't you shouldn't be on a fucking podcast about rookies Duncan Kincaid's gonna operate as he's just different man he's gonna operate as their slot like a giant slot wide receiver I I don't the upside is going to be fucking crazy with Duncan Kincaid here and I know everyone loves to make those arguments of like oh this this quarterback likes to use his tight ends or doesn't it's funny how that anytime you drop a really good tight end into an offense that quarterback just loves to use tight ends then they just start to love to use tight ends. You put good players in good offenses, and the quarterbacks tend to use them, okay? It's, it's not a matter of, oh, we don't like to use tight ends or we like to use tight ends. Don Kincaid, first-round draft capital to the Buffalo Bills with Josh Allen. Do not fucking overthink this. This dude is the best pass catcher at the tight end position in this class, and it's not fucking close. And it never was. It never has been, okay? Don Kincaid, I actually have above Zay Flowers. So if I'm recapping the rankings here, which, again, all of my rankings, we're not going to do this for day two because there's just going to be too many players. But all my rankings will be available on bdge.co. You cop the rookie draft guide. We'll be updating all the fantasy outlooks and landing spots for these rookies uh, after day two, after day three, all this kind of stuff. But for right now, the way I'm ranking the rookies, Bijan, Bryce Young, Anthony Richardson, CJ Stroud, Jameer Gibbs, JSN, Quentin Johnson, Jordan Addison, Dalton Kincaid, Zay Flowers. Okay? Um, that's how I have it. And there's there are, there's a lot to look towards in, in day two. We still have Will Levis on the board. Still got Hendon Hooker on the board. I think there will be some veteran trades, like what happens with D-Hop. Does Eckler move? DeAndre Swift, when does he go? Dalvin Cook, possibly. Like, a lot of stuff still to happen. You know, it's it's like, Will Levis, does a team trade up for him? Or is he just left for dead? At this point, I mean, day two draft capital, he slides really far down the Superflex rookie rankings. He's going to be probably the biggest dropper. And then you begs the question, the next running back. Because the first two went off the board so quickly, does that push the rest of them up a little bit? Do we see Charbonnet go in the back of the second round? Do we see a team, I think more and more we're seeing teams that like, where their GMs or front offices think they're so good at identifying like special traits and talents, where I wouldn't even really be surprised if someone looks at like Dev Devon H.A. and he's like, that is a piece that we need for the future of our offense. He fits exactly what we're trying to do so well. Let it, let's, you know, let's use that day two pick on him. Let's use the day three pick on him. Like we saw James Cook go in fucking round two last year. Wouldn't be crazy to see one of these other running backs get picked in round two now that the other two running backs, because there are a lot of mock drafts that had Jameer Gibbs going in round two. And if that's the case, then it's like, okay, makes sense to like have the tier gap. It's like, all right, Gibbs round two, this next guy round three, but those guys go top 12. And now it's just like anyone's kind of waiting for that running back run to happen. The same thing that we saw with the wide receivers in round one. So Crazy shit happening all over the place. Me and Noah will be bike here tomorrow, recapping round two. Make sure you got notifications on because we're going live for a full mock draft on Underdog today, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. And I'll see you all for the draft recap tomorrow. Wow.